Welcome back to a wild and crazy day here at uh, the Frat House and five minutes at the Frat House on the first day of the NCAA tournament with Frat House Mike and Sidekick. And without a doubt, this is one of my favorite times of the year, one of my favorite entire weekends of the entire year. As we are going through right now, we are halfway through 16 college basketball games going on today, and then again, we'll do it all over again tomorrow, 16 games again tomorrow. Throw in there on top of all that, hey, big shout out to my LaSalle Explorers playing tomorrow in the field of 64 for the first time in 21 years after winning a play-in oh, game. Absolutely, after winning a play-in game last night against uh, Boise State. Um, and so here we go uh, with this very NCAA tournament-flavored five minutes at the Pratt House. But uh, Psychic, we're going to kick it off where we usually do uh, yep. with our weekly wrap-up uh, and preview of this week's motorsports. And there's a lot to cover uh, as we had both uh, not only NASCAR, but we also had NHRA back in action this past Sunday. Yes, we did. Now, over in uh, NASCAR, uh, we went down, as we were talking about last week, we went down to everybody's favorite short track down there in Tennessee to Bristol Motor Speedway. Uh, where, as usual, well, we saw uh, 10 cautions and 17 lead changes. Uh, that was all before Casey Kane took his first checkered of uh, this early season. Others who came in the top five down there at Bristol uh, included Kyle Busch, who started the uh, race on the pole. Brad Kozlowski came in third. Kurt, uh, Kurt Busch, who historically runs well uh, at this particular track, well, he came in fourth, and Clint Boyer had his first top five of the year. He came in fifth. Uh, the race's laps leader, Denny Hamlin, 117 laps he had in that particular race, only came in 23rd. Um, and that kind of set us up with a rather odd looking leaderboard as we enter week five of the uh, Sprint Cup se uh, season. Uh, defending champion uh, Brad Kozlowski now takes over the number one spot. Dale Jr. moves back up into the number two spot. Jimmy Johnson drops down to number three, and then Clint Boyer and uh, Greg Biffle, will they make the top five board for the first time this season? Uh, Got to ask you, sidekick. Now, look, I know it's early in the season. What do you make of this board? Uh, we've had four winners so far this season, but on that board right now, we only have one who, who actually won a race. That's the first thing that jumps out at me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that jumps out at me, you only have... Um, uh, you got one in there that has no top fives at all, and you got one in there that only has one top five. What do you make of this board? It, I mean, I understand it's early. Yeah. Well, actually, if you look at it, it doesn't, you know, you were saying how odd it looks. It actually doesn't look that odd. It's vaguely similar to the end of last season well, when you talk about when you talk about where, where the drivers are. In right. That. Um, right. You know, uh, and also, you know, two big movers this week. Um Casey Kane and Kyle Busch both shot up seven spots right. on it. So, you know, it is still early. Um, but the you fact know, you've got Greg Biffle on there with no top fives at all, and yet we've got three winners that aren't even represented on the top five board. Right. I mean, that just well, seems only, a little... We're, we're only four races in, is so you're a... going to have people, you, you know, right. that don't have wins. As a matter of fact, if you go and you look at your wild cards, Matt Kenseth is 13th in points. Mm -hmm. he's, the, he's the last wild card. Is this a phenomenon, say, of Bristol and some of the, you know, you know, so many lead changes and 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 the cautions and the fact no, that I don't, were... I don't, I don't think it it's you know a result of Bristol. Um, I just think it it's you know it's still early and it's easy. You don't have a lot of races to have a lot of winners. Right. Um, the other thing that helps in the points is you know consistency. Right. You know, that's why we see Brad up there. Well, absolutely. You know, he's consistently running top fives and, you know, top tens. So that's why he's at the top right now. Right. As we get farther in the season and, you know, you get more races and you get more winners and stuff, you'll you'll kind of see the, see it, Even you'll out. see the, the, the winners kind of float towards the top, especially once you get into the, the multiple, the repeat winners and right. stuff. That's, I guess, I guess that kind of what I was waiting for <clears throat> I was a little bit surprised because as I pointed out there we all we have had three other winners who are not represented on that top five board right. uh, at this current time now racing styles uh, change again this week yep. as we go from huh, 
short track. And last week, we head out to the Auto Club Speedway in Fontana, California. And that's a two mile, 200 lap super speedway. So we go from one extreme to the other. Uh, now you can catch that race uh, live on Fox beginning at 3 p.m. on Sunday. Tell us I kick out, does that super speedway change our strategies when it comes to our fantasy? Well, it's well, another my week. strategies aren't working, you gotta know. <laughs> well, you're not listening to me, apparently. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. I'm listening. I'm listening. I write so, everything down you say. What are you talking about? Yeah, and then you do exactly the opposite of it. <laughs> I goofed. <laughs> so it's another week, and it's another different racetrack type uh, this week. Uh, we're going out to Auto Club Speedway out in Fontana, California, who is the sister track of Michigan International. Right. And you'll want to remember that because they're essentially the same tracks. The only difference between the two tracks, <clears throat> Auto Club has 14... Uh, 14% banking, whereas uh, Michigan has an 18% bank. Right. Um, but you're basically, you know, keep an eye on this race when you're setting up your picks in in June and in August for the two Michigan races. Okay. This is the only race at uh, Auto Club. Right. Um, and this is a Roush track. Roush has uh, traditionally dominated here at this track. Last couple of years, you've had a couple other people in there. But for the most part, you, you really can't go wrong with Roush, uh, and you'll see that in my picks this week. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to start off with uh, Greg Biffle. Uh, finished sixth here last year and a, has a fourth place and a win at Michigan. Right. And he's going for $27. Uh, I'm going to put Junior Nation up there, uh, Earnhardt Jr. Uh, third place last year here, a win and a fourth place finish at Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, he's... At $28, a little pricey. Uh, Carl Edwards. Uh, Carl Edwards got has 20 top 10s in his first 22 appearances at Auto Club, Speedway, and Michigan International. Uh, his last 10 attempts, though, he's kind of cooled off, and he's only got five top 10s with an additional three top 15s. Mm -hmm. He's sitting at about $23. But, again, he'll probably run well here. Like I said, you know, it's a Roush track. Uh, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. is expected to run here. He's a Roush guy. Okay. Okay. He's going to benefit from having Biffle and Carl Edwards. So his car is going to come off the hauler, okay. and it's going to be fast. All right. And he's his price. He's bargain price at thirteen seventy five. And then I'm going to throw our good friend AJ Allmendinger in there, um, just because we need to round out the roster, um, and he's a driver we can afford with our hundred dollar limit. He's seven seventy five, which takes us to a grand total of ninety nine seventy five. Uh, real quick on the Stenhouse thing, um, yep. would you give any consideration to how he qualifies in whether you would put him in that lineup? Let's say he qualifies very poorly. Um, I might I might look into a little bit. Okay. Um, but at this point, you're. You're kind of trying to fill out the roster. Right, right. I and know. That, We're and, down at the and, bottom. Yeah, you're at the bottom, and there's not a lot in that price range. Right. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe he qualifies poorly, and he'll come back in the race. Yeah. You know. Bipple at 27. Wow, he really jumped up in price, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, wow. he's, been, he's been jumping up in price. All right, let's take a look then at our top 10 uh, teams right now in the Frat House League. Of course, we've got 17 actually in the league, uh, but this is a listing right now of our top 10. And uh, currently, our, uh, uh, our unfortunately absent technical director, Brandon, uh, he hangs in there at the top, uh, as well does uh, uh, our production manager, who is sitting in quite nicely for him this evening, uh, Jen. She stays there in the, uh, uh, on the top 10 board as well. Sidekick tied for a ninth. And talking about consistency in NASCAR, there you go. I've got it going on. I'm holding steady at 16. It's an outrage. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Listen, one more quick uh, motorsports update. Uh, and, and I prefaced it on the front end here. And that was uh, NHRA as uh, drag racing. Uh, got moving again this past weekend down in Gainesville, Florida at the uh, Gator Nationals. Uh, and a bit of a surprise in our favorite funny car division uh, in Sunday's finals when Del Worsham beat John Force Racing's Robert Hite. And then Johnny Gray went on and beat Jack Beckman in uh, the round three elimination. 
And that set up a matchup between Del Worsham and uh, Johnny Gray in the final round, where Gray ran at 315.5 miles per hour in just over four seconds to get only his fourth victory in Funny Car in 13 finals. Uh, and so that was just one little wrinkle in the whole thing that makes our early uh, season leaderboard quite interesting and uh, very, very competitive over in the top fuel dragster division. Antron Brown uh, took over the top spot by beating Clay Milliken in the final. Uh, Antron, however, uh, only holds a very narrow four-point lead over Tony Schumacher. <coughs> Excuse me. Ron Cap stays at the top of the funny car, uh, car category, but that's deceiving uh, because he's dead tie right now with uh, Gator National winner Johnny Gray. Uh, over in uh, Pro Stock, Mike Edwards uh, took over the uh, top spot despite the fact he lost in the round three elimination to Jake uh, Coughlin. Uh, Edwards is just 16 points ahead of Coughlin for uh, that lead. All right. Yep. And now with Mike Edwards moving up, yep. you know, we've got Chevy now at the top yes. and broke up that strangle hold that the Dodges had, one, two, and three. Yep. So now they're two, three, and four. Don't look for that to hang there too long, though. I don't think. That's just, based on history, I don't think that's going to stay there. All right, there's our NHRA update, uh, and they're off again for the uh, next three weeks or so, thereabouts, uh, until early April when everybody heads out to the strip at Las Vegas Motor Speedway for the Summit Nationals, and we'll bring you those results then. All right, listen, let's turn our attention to what everybody else is focused on, and I see Sidekick over here is focused on it as well. Yep. I'm focused on it. We all got our mobile devices up here as we are tracking what's going on in the NCAA tournament with the field of 64 having tipped off this afternoon at 12 p uh, 12 15 uh, p.m. this afternoon and already we've had eight of the scheduled uh, 16 games completed at this point <coughs> excuse me and the bracket was released on uh, Sunday and there were a couple of things that jumped out at me uh, off of it uh, most alarming to me was both Duke and uh, Louisville in the exact same Midwest region uh, with Louisville getting the number one seed and Duke getting a number two, which I kind of felt was a bit reversed. I should have thought I thought it was going to be the other way around. Uh, often rumored that nationally, uh, nationally number one ranked Gonzaga, and it was often rumored that they would not get a number one seed. They actually did out of the West region. And a bit surprising to me was uh, Kansas getting a number one uh, seed in the, so in the South region. Now, not surprising, Indiana got the fourth number one seed in the East. All right? And so with all those different things happening, and then, of course, then we're always expecting the Cinderella teams or two to come in and kind of upset things and throw the upsets into the, into the mix and perhaps even make some deep runs. All of these kinds of things were on my mind, and I posed some of these questions to our Fan Junkies Radio NCAA analyst, and CEO of Five Star Basketball Camp, Lee Klein, on yesterday's Fan Junkies radio program. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering how well you might have done with your bracket selections, well, let me bring you just a portion of the conversation that I had with Lee and some of the suggestions that he made. Listen in on this, then you can go and compare your bracket, and perhaps maybe you might sit there and go, ah, I don't know if I did so well. Let me bring you a little get bit. Get some facts and come back and see. You're going to get them right now. Let me bring you a little bit of that conversation here. Lee, right thanks now. for joining us again. I've been looking forward to this. Well, there's no crystal ball, <laughs> and they play, and they don't play the game on paper. They play it on a court, and as we sit there and we look at it, we try to project who should win or who's better than who. At the end of the day. The kids and the coaches, they're just not sure which of their, you know, well, who's showing up. Right. Each team's a Jekyll and Hyde. Each team's got its good and bad days. So that's what makes it so fun. Let me go to my first question. Should Duke have gotten a number one? I frankly felt they should have. Second question, is Louisville really a number one? Number three, is Gonzaga really a number one? Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that – they're, Duke did enough out of conference to still manage away on the one line, but for no, there's no way that neither 
Miami or Duke should be on the one line. Miami's the one who really got slighted. For Duke to put them on the two because they lost, you could see that. But Miami's the one who got slighted. Louisville, by winning the Big East, which was the second rated conference, um, you know, put itself in position with another with a great late season run. I want to say eight in a row off the top of my head, where to put themselves as the number one team as far as the number one seed. The problem is that that Midwest bracket that served them very little good because they loaded the Midwest with twelve tough teams. Yeah. So from one to twelve, one to twelve is you know that's the toughest region, and, yep. and so. What you know, Louisville much rather have had a two seed in, uh, for instance, in, in the West right. than be the one seed in the Midwest. It, it right. makes no sense. And then last, you know, last part I believe you asked me was about um, Gonzaga. Gonzaga. So Gonzaga deserved to be a one seed. You can't be the number one team in the country in AP and not be on the top line. There's, there's no way you can justify that. But now, here's what I don't understand. If Gonzaga is your third or fourth lowest one seed, if Louisville and Indiana rightfully so are the top two one seeds, right? Mm-hmm. How do you not have Duke and Miami in with, you know, one of those should be in with Gonzaga. Those are the two best two seeds on the board. Mm-hmm. So it, it makes it makes no sense. Ohio State was on the 3-4 line a week ago. So now they're they're they become a two seed. It just makes no sense. Uh, Who's the Cinderella this year? I've heard it could be St. Louis. I've heard it could be New Mexico. Uh, however, you didn't rate either one of those teams uh, very high. I think in the recent uh, article I read from you uh, on uh, uh, brackets uh, 101 over on 247sports.com. Um, wh- where do you see the Cinderellas coming out of this? There's somebody, it's either going to be Arizona or Notre Dame, can make a real run at this thing if they can play what like they're capable of playing. I think the West, there's one bracket that's going to blow up, okay? that's Historically, that's what happens. One bracket that's going to blow up. <laughs> Where's the bracket going to be? Usually you have, you'll see there'll be two double digits playing each other to go to see who advances to the Sweet 16. Um, and, and generally there's a 12 seed that, you know, each year, I mean, since 2001, there's been a 12 seed win the first round game over a five since 2001. So there's definitely going to be a 12 seed that's going to go far. I think that 12 could be California okay. because of the three, of because of the guards, uh, because of the guard play. But, you know, remember this Cal team that lost to Utah its wow. last game. So anything is in Utah, you know, is not a great team, so anything's possible. A lot of people like Oregon against right. Oklahoma State. Right. And you have Dana Altman there, and, and he's a tremendous coach. But now you go into you got two freshman guards. Now Kentucky was able to win easily with freshmen, but you got two key components of freshman guards for Oregon, and and that's certainly something that concerns me because I love tournament experience when it comes down to going and advancing. So I thought I think Arizona's the sleeper team that okay. has the talent. They has they had the talent. They've kind of underachieved since December. They've been underachieving. They haven't played great. But you know, they, they just had a little funny thing happen, you know, in the Pac twelve tournament in which there was a no call. There was a call that should have not been a call and they lost the two point game down knocked down the Pac twelve tournament and Sean Miller got fired up for it. Right, distant. But I think Duke's got the the easier path in Duke versus Louisville. I think Duke has more weapons to score the basketball. So I like Duke to make it to the Final Four. I think they are uh, a little bit under the radar this year. Every year I root against Duke. I do <laughs> think this year lines up for them. Who do you have your other three? Are you willing to give us those? Yeah, yeah. I, I like my national champion is Kansas. Ah. And I think the Jayhawks, one, they've got the experience. They've got senior guards, Travis Relaford, Elijah Johnson. They've got 
senior post presence and Jeff Withy, a, a rim protector and a difference maker. I think what more likely you're going to have Miami taking out Indiana to advance out of the East. But the um, that's you, I definitely look for that in the uh, in the Elite Eight. And I think on the like I said on the back side on when we went back to the West, I, I think it. You know, I went with Arizona. I think it could also be a Notre Dame uh, that would advance, and eventually, I get you know Duke taking that, taking them out to play Kansas with Kansas beating Duke for the for the title. Okay, so uh, let me make sure I got this. Duke, Kansas. Uh, you're saying it'll be Indiana or Miami coming out of the uh, East, and Arizona or Notre Dame coming out of the West. Right. That's, okay. uh, and I'm picking Ari- on my bracket. I picked Arizona, um, but it's you know we're rolling the dice. Belmont's a dangerous first round team. Yes, they it is. Shoots yep. three well. That's yep. got a couple five star kids and seniors and and so on. I just think that um, you know we get back to sort of this this motivating factor, right? So Arizona is a team that you know last year. You know, it's a team that's got something to prove. Mm-hmm. It's a team that's built for the tournament. Already, right, and there you have it, uh, some a terrific insight uh, there on collegiate basketball from a very, very knowledgeable uh, a guy in Coach Klein. Uh, did you listen to anything he had to say? Absolutely. You, you, got, you took some notes? I, I <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. All right. Now, I mentioned before eight games in the books, and, and we've got games ongoing at this particular time right now. Let's take a quick look. Have there been any serious upsets uh, so far encountered uh, through half of the games uh, so far today? And I think probably the biggest one, number eight, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, going down to number nine, Wichita State. Uh, Pittsburgh lost 55 uh, at Wichita State, had 73. So 73-55 final uh, for Wichita State. That one did mess up my bracket just a tad. Did it mess up yours? Uh, Minor. A little bit. Okay. Messed me up just a little bit as I had. Pittsburgh advancing into the, uh, not only the next round, but I think the one after that. Uh, now, we're talking about this. Uh, we both played our own bracket mm-hmm. uh, in the Frat House uh, Sports League, uh, where, by the way, we had a tremendous response to participation in our Bracket Challenge uh, League from our Frat House Sports Facebook page. Uh, we've got over 20 folks right now included in that league, so thank you very, very much. I want to throw that out, and I, I appreciate that. But let's take a look at this sidekick just for just for the fun of it. Uh, who who did you have in your final four and final two, and then who did you have going to your uh, to the championship? Well, this here I haven't got a brain is the money shot. <laughs> this this is the bracket. Okay. So final four, as much I really really deliberated on this one because I wanted so bad. To, to put my to put my Billikens in the final four, and I I had to be a little bit of a realist and you know say okay. okay. So my final four, I do have them knocking off Louisville, but then losing to Duke. Wow, you got St. Louis knocking off Louisville. Okay, go ahead. Um, so my final four are Duke, Gonzaga, Florida, and Indiana, with my final two being Duke and Indiana, with Indiana taking it. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, we're right. We're the same on our final two. Uh, my final four include Duke, Ohio State, Kansas, and Indiana. With Duke playing Indiana for the national championship and Duke winning it all. So, there you have it. Nobody's perfect. Well, this, this could will, get interesting. This, this could, could get very it. interesting next week. All right. All right. So, there's our tournament talk for the moment. Uh, yep. Don't forget that what you can do, if you want, if you should, you actually you should, you can get more live updates from me on Saturday when I bring you Frat House Saturdays on Fan Junkies Radio, where I bring you this very show on that program at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, Fan Junkies Radio over on Blog Talk Radio. Be sure to be listening in. Uh, give me a call. Um, and then next week at this time. We'll be bringing you the up-to-date bracket again. We'll take a look at both sidekicks and my bracket and see where we stand at that particular time. All right. And since we're talking brackets, we thought this would be a good time to bring you 
another installment of our top five. Yes, sir. And this week, it's our top five surefire ways to buck your NCAA bracket. And coming in at number seven, team colors play a large factor in your decision making. Sure, you know what? Just pick them by color. Yeah, why not? Why not? Those are pretty colors you have. Thank, thank you very much. I picked mine by color today. What color am I wearing? Go ahead. <laughs> number six, team mascots are totally Final Four material. Absolutely. You gotta love the mascots. Coming in at number five, you listen to and overanalyze way too many bracketology experts. Now, not me, though. I never do that. I never. Don't, I don't ever do it. Never. No, no. Coming in at number four, you choose your schools by their proximity to St. Louis. <laughs> Or your location. Uh, 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 coming in at number three, you really buy into the whole Cinderella story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you got some Cinderella's picked in? Uh, yeah. Uh, coming in at number two, you pick the underdogs to win every matchup, uh, or the meek shall win the tournament. <laughs> All right, and coming in at number one, the number one surefire way to bust your bracket. Well, sidekick helped you pick your bracket. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> a little swerve on that one, huh? Oh, they got you on that one. All right, there you have it. And hopefully you didn't make any of those My picks. mistakes. And uh, we wish everyone the best of luck in their bracket games, uh, particularly everyone that's participating in our Frat House Sports Bracket Challenge. Uh, and as always, I want to send a, a shout out to our production director, uh, Jen, for putting together that insightful lesson for us there. All right, remember. Okay, let's stick with round ball for just a few more moments and take a look at what's happening over in the NBA as we move closer and closer to the conclusion of the season. Uh, hard to believe we're here we are it's uh, what uh, the, the end of March right March 21 I can't believe it we only have about a month left of the NBA season over in the Atlantic Division the New York uh, Knicks right now continue to hold on in the top spot there but they're just a point now just a point in front of the Brooklyn Nets the Brooklyn Nets could actually make a run at them uh, in the waning days over in the Central Division the uh, Indiana Pacers they're still in front Five games in front of the Chicago Bulls. Yep. And they've oh. clinched the playoff spot now. Oh, did they clinch it? Okay, yep. I did not. I failed to recognize that. Thank you for bringing us up to date. So they've clinched. Yep, the uh, Heat have clinched. The Heat have clinched. And talking about the Heat over in the Southeast Division, uh, 53 and 14 they are. This is becoming more and more of a story as we continue to go forward. Last night, winning their 24th straight game. Yep. Now, here's the best part of it. They were down by 27 points at halftime. Down by 27 and came back and won. They are now 15 and a half games in front of the Atlanta Hawks. Uh, I'm sorry, in front of the, I'm sorry, five games in front of the Chicago Bulls. That's the, no, no, I got that right. 15 and a half games in front of the Atlanta Hawks. Sorry. Over in the Northwest. Which I'm, one is I'm getting it, all mixed up. I'm getting, I'm, I'm off you're, my line. You're all excited. I'm off all my right. line. I'm off my line. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm too used to reading brackets. Uh, over in the Northwest. The Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, three games in front of the Denver Nuggets. And they have clinched as well. Okay, so we've got three that have clinched. Um, in the Pacific Division, the L.A. Clippers, eight and a half games in front of the Golden State Warriors. And in the Southwest, the San Antonio Spurs, uh, five and a half games in front of the Memphis Grizzlies. Now, And they have clinched as well. My goodness, we've got four? Yes. Four out of six of the division leaders yep. have clinched a playoff spot. Not, not yeah, necessarily clinched right. the division. It, it's clinched a playoff a spot, yes. Right. <clears throat> now, last week I brought you a whole rundown on the playoffs and what the playoff scenarios might look like. We're going to hold on to that until next week. And so I'll give you a little snapshot of that as we uh, advance forward uh, next week. All right? Uh, before we get off a of round ball, let's go take a look real quick at our Frat House Facebook post of the week. This week it was the most viewed post on our Facebook page, and this one revolved around somebody we really haven't spoken about too, too much here, uh, probably because we really don't want to, but it's everybody's favorite gold digger, uh, Philadelphia 76ers, uh, Andrew Bynum, uh, making $16.5 million for bowling. Uh, yeah, that's what he's doing this year. Yep. 
uh, bowling and uh, you know just going out and making public appearances every once in a while at beer distributors. Um, <coughs> the other evening I uh, posted the breaking news, one unconfirmed and previously uh, recently unreliable source indicates that Philadelphia 76ers Andrew Bynum's season of non-play is officially over as he will undergo surgery tomorrow. Uh, it was posted the other evening. And so, lo and behold, the guy that only showed up as a sixer just to put the jersey on once and get a picture taken, never stepped out on the court at all, never played a single minute, his season is over. That post got the most views and numerous comments, and so I thank you all for that. Keep the post coming. And uh, for all of our new folks out there, of which we've had about seven new members to the Frat, uh, Frat House yep. Sports page this week, uh, be sure to jump in, comment often, post your own, whatever. Just get over there and, 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 and make, make some comments. Jump in there anytime you see something. <coughs> we've had a few division changes over in the NHL. Um, and as in most cases right now, I think we are about 20 games uh, remaining in this shortened season. <clears throat> and so let's take a look at the divisional standings. Uh, in, the, uh, in the Atlantic Division, the Pittsburgh uh, Penguins, uh, still without an overtime loss, 23 and 8, 46 points. They're now 14 points ahead of both the New York Rangers and the New Jersey Devils, who are both tied for second. In the uh, Northeast Division, uh, the Montreal Canadiens continue to lead that one. Uh, two points ahead of the Boston Bruins. In the Southeast, here's where we've got a division change. The Winnipeg Jets uh, take over uh, as the leader in that division. They're just two points ahead of the previous uh, leader uh, in the Cal uh, Carolina Hurricanes. In the Central Division, the Chicago Blackhawks with 51 points. They are 17 points ahead of, of the new second place uh, team, your St. Louis Blues, if you're interested. Uh, in the Northwest, the Minnesota Wild. <coughs> Excuse me, I got such a ah, tick all there. Uh, north in the, uh, the Minnesota Wild take over as the new points leader. Two points ahead of the Vancouver Canucks. And in the Pacific Division, the Anaheim Ducks are 12 points ahead of the LA Kings. All right. Uh, and just like I said last week uh, with the NBA, we will take a look at where the playoffs stand uh, next week. Uh, when I give you a rundown and a snapshot of what that's looking like. Okay. There's our wrap-up for this week. We're going to want to, we want to get right back to all these TV sets we've got here at the Frat House to take a look at what's going on in the NCAA tournament as we've got no less than about six or seven or eight games still remaining before uh, we're done for the evening. So we want to get back to that and let you guys get back to it as well. So that's our show for the week. Let's run around real quick. Fan junkies, get over there. Social media at its best, where sports meets social media uh, and social networking. Uh, fanjunkies.net, sign up completely free. Uh, you can uh, do that at any time. It just takes a couple of minutes. <coughs> Fan Junkies Radio goes strong. We had, uh, boy, we had a terrific show. I don't know if you heard it on Monday. Carrie Frazier, former NHL referee. Just superb. Great stories on Monday. And then, of course, yesterday we had Lee Klein. <coughs> Herb, Quiet, no spells, I'm broadcasting. Herb FM Sports. Uh, they continue to broadcast us uh, for at least an hour or so. Uh, uh, I, have you gotten a schedule for this week? I haven't seen one. No, I haven't seen one yet, no. Okay. But you got to get over there. <clears throat> uh, HerbFM.com. That's where you go to, and you can check their schedule, and you will find us on their regular schedule every week. Uh, they generally broadcast us for about an hour over there. CLW 83, all of the Fan Junkies radio programs, and of course, uh, that includes Frat House Saturdays are, are rebroadcast on CLW83.com. And of course, FratHouseSports.net, our own website. All right. Okay. There you go. Enjoy the madness of March as we are going to as well, and we will be back yep. here with you again next week. In the meantime, you know what you got to do? You got to keep us real. You got to keep us live. And you got to keep us going. We'll see you then. See you then. I hope you're not crying next week. Right front going down. Final lap for Casey Kane. Just bring it on home here. Sails nice. it off into turn three. Gets underneath Joey Logano. 
And Casey Kane wins the Food City 500 at Bristol. Nice job. Yeah. Good job, guys. Awesome job. Good job, Kevin. Way to go, boys. Way to go. That's a big accomplishment today.